Hello, GCSE students. The strange times we live in mean that I am self-isolating and to overcome this to some degree, uh, I'm creating a series of pre-planned lessons that go some way to uh, enabling you to not miss out. Uh, to make this work, we're going to focus on GCSE English language and it's gonna start with paper two. Now, if you're looking at this at some point in the future, uh, whether in my class or not, this is a, hopefully a really good revision resource. Let's share the screen. So uh, this is the title, English Language Paper 2. It's June 2018, that's the paper, it's, uh, that's when it was first sat. Uh, and the two extracts are Morning Glass and uh, the Hawaiian Archipelago, Archipelago I should say. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is read these two extracts. So let's go to the right screen and we will find it. So on the screen is what this particular exam paper looks like. It looks like the other one. Um, it's all remarkably straightforward. And the first thing that you do with any one of these exams is read the question paper. And you do this so that you know what you're looking for when you read the extract. So. So far, so familiar, one hopes. Um, if you're a year 10 student and you've not seen this before, well, it's, it's slightly different, but it's effectively asking you to list things. Read again the first part of the source um, from only lines 1 to 13, uh, and then you circle the statements that are correct. We then carry on. We look at question two, which asks, shut the door, uh, which asks you to read both sources. And it's quite a tricky question in some respects. Um, both sources describe the types of board used for surfing. Okay, you think surfing, fine. Um, use details from both sources to write a summary of what you understand about the different boards. So it's about surfboards in this particular, for this question. So what do we learn about the surfboards? Okay, and I've stored that in my head. So when I read it, I, I think about surfboards. The third question, we scroll, scroll through. Uh, how does the writer use language to describe the surfers and the sea? Um, you can see that here that it's only focusing on a small section of lines, um, but this is very much like a question on the first paper, which asks you to look at how language is used to describe a character, the weather, a mood, whatever it is. Scroll through again. That's worth 12 marks, we'll see in the bottom right there of the screen. Uh, and then the fourth question. The whole of source A, it tells us, and it's, it's there highlighted in bold, so we must pay attention to these things. If I can make it work, it's highlighted in bold, the whole of source A, the whole of source B, so we have to read it. Compare how the writers convey their different perspectives, viewpoints, what they think, what they feel on surfing. So then ask you to look at their viewpoints, the methods, and then use some quotation. So, so far, so straightforward. Uh, the rest of this video is just going to read the two extracts. And I'm talking you through the process of what one should do um, in any kind of time situation. Here are the two extracts. We should pay attention to these pieces of information. Um, they might be helpful. So source A is 20th century literary nonfiction. So this is somebody's real perspective. Um, it's an extract from an autobiography by Mike, Mike Doyle, published in 93, 1993 that is. Source B is 19th century. A letter, an extract from a letter by Isabella Bird, published in 1875. Okay. Then the next pieces of information we provided with are these boxes at the top. Um, so I'm wiggling the mouse here. You know, there's a box at the top, all of this. Don't overlook it. It's also is taken from Morning Glass, the autobiography of a professional surfer. So now we should be thinking, oh, okay. So professional presumably implies some sort of level of expertise, he knows what he's doing, um, that, that should guide us in some way. Uh, in this extract he describes 
his introduction to the world of surfing at the beach near his home in California in the 1950s. So I can do some sort of brief uh, inference here. I can make some brief inferences, which is it's written in 93, um, published in 93, but in the 1950s, this is a person who's reminiscing, who's looking back, there's hindsight, there's sense of retrospect. And just in case that wasn't obvious, you know, he describes his introduction to the world of surfing. Let's read. The first time I ever saw somebody riding a surfboard was at the Manhattan Pier in 1953. As much time as I'd spent at the beach, you'd think I would have at least seen one surfer before then. But there were only a few dozen surfers in all of California at that time. And like surfers today, they were out at dawn surfing the morning glass. By the time the crowds arrived, they were gone. But this one morning, I took the first bus to the beach, walked out onto the Manhattan Pier, looked down and saw these bronzed gods, all in incredibly good shape, happier and healthier than anybody I'd ever seen. They sat astride their boards, laughing with each other. At, fir at the first swell, they swung their long boards around, dropped to their stomachs and began paddling towards shore. From my viewpoint, it was almost as if I were on the board myself, paddling for the swell, sliding into the wave, coming to my feet and angling the board down that long wall of green water. It was almost as if I already knew that feeling in my bones. From that day on, I knew that surfing was fine for me. Surfing was fine, I knew that surfing was for me. There were several surfers out that day. Greg Knoll was just a little kid then, about 16 years old, but he was hot. On one way, he turned around backward on his board, showing off a bit for the people watching from the pier. I was just dazzled. Once I discovered there was such a thing as surfing, I began plotting my chance to try it. I used to stand out in the surf and wait until one of the surfers lost his board. The boards then were 11 feet long, 24 inches wide and weighed 50 or 60 pounds. When they washed in broadside, they would hit me in the legs and knock me over. I would jump back up, scramble the board around, hop on and paddle it 10 feet before the owner snatched it back. Thanks kid, and paddled away. Most surfers at that time were riding either hollow paddle boards, a wooden framework with a plywood shell, or solid redwood slabs, some of them 12 feet long. The much lighter and much better balsa wood boards were just starting to appear. One day in 1954, when I was 13, I was down at Manhattan Pier watching a guy ride a huge old fashioned paddleboard, what we used to call a coop box. It was hollow, made of mahogany, about 14 feet long, maybe 65 pounds and had no fin. It was the kind of paddleboard lifeguards used for res rescues. They worked fine for that purpose, but for surfing they were unbelievably awkward. When the guy came out of the water, dragging the board behind him, I asked if I could borrow it for a while. He looked at me like, get lost kid. But when he sat down on the beach, I pestered him until he finally shrugged and nodded toward the board. I'd watched enough surfing by then to have a pretty clear idea of the technique involved. I dragged the board into the water and flopped on top of it. After a while, I managed to paddle the thing out beyond the shore break and got it turned around. To my surprise, after a few awkward tries, I managed to get that big clumsy thing going left on a three foot wave. I came to my feet, right foot forward, just like riding a scooter. I had no way of turning the board, but for a brief, sorry, but for a few brief seconds, I was gliding over the water. As the wave started to break behind me, I looked back then completely panicked. I hadn't thought that far ahead yet. My first impulse was to bail out, so I jumped out in front of the board, spread eagled. I washed up on the beach, dragged myself onto the dry sand, and lay there groaning. That's the first one. Now, I'm thinking already, the questions I was asked was, was, were about, excuse me, the different types of board, so now I'm thinking, well, where, where was that? Right. Where was the section just all about surfboards? I can ignore everything else about surfboards. And I think, oh, look, that was around here. Look, here, see, from sort of line 29 onwards. There's this whole section here about 
different types of surfboard. Um, I need to start thinking about the ways in which his perspective is being conveyed, his viewpoint. And broadly speaking, I'm thinking, this guy loves surfing. How do I know that? He's a professional surfer. This is his first go at it. He really wants to do it. He admires the people who surf. He gives it a go. He gets a bit scared. Uh, he bails out. So I'm, what I'm ultimately trying to do is track, follow his thought processes through the piece of writing. And if I can track how the writer thinks, and if I can track how the writer feels, then I'm onto a winner with this particular uh, paper. And I do exactly the same thing for the second source. I read the top. In 1875, the British explorer, oh right, so she does that for a living. She tries to find new things, presumably. Isabella Bird traveled to Hawaii, an island in the Pacific Ocean. Now, this is where this exam is a bit of a pain because it requires some reasonable general knowledge. Um, at this stage, Hawaii is sort of just an island in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, its attachment to the United States of America is not yet uh, sort of complete. So it's a kind of new, new world for a British explorer. It carries on. Source B is an extract from a letter she wrote to her sister back in England describing a visit to the Hawaiian town of Hilo. I presume it's Hilo, it could be Hilo. At that time in Britain, surfing or surf bathing was a completely unknown sport. Right, so I, I'm therefore expecting uh, to read about somebody who has never seen this before and either they're going to be like, wow, my gosh, isn't it amazing these people doing some surfing or what on earth are they doing? Um, I don't need to guess though, I just read it. Let's have a read. Our host came in to say that a grand display of the national sport of surf bathing was going on, and the large party of us went down to the beach for two hours to enjoy it. It is really a most exciting pastime, and in a rough sea requires immense nerve. The surfboard is a tough plank of wood shaped like a coffin lid, about two feet broad and from six to nine feet long well oiled and cared for. They are usually made of wood from the native breadfruit tree and then blessed in a simple ritual. The surf was he very heavy and favourable and legions of local people were swimming and splashing in the sea, though not more than 40 had their papahenalu or wave sliding boards with them. The men, each carrying their own hand carved boards under their arms, waded out from some rocks on which the sea was breaking and, pushing their boards before them, some swam out to the first line of breakers and then diving down were seen no more till they reappeared half a mile from shore. What they seek is a very high breaker, on the top of which they leap from behind, lying face downwards on their boards. As the wave speeds on and the bottom strikes the ground, the top breaks into a huge coma. The swimmers appear posing themselves on its highest edge by dexterous movements of their hands and feet, keeping just at the top of the curl, but always apparently coming downhill with a slanting motion. So they rode in majestically, always just ahead of the breaker, carried shorewards by its mighty impulse at the rate of 40 miles an hour, as the more daring riders knelt and even stood on their surfboards, waving their arms and uttering exultant cries. They were always apparently on the verge of engulfment by the fierce breaker whose towering white crest was ever above and just behind them. But just as one expected to see them dashed to pieces, they either waded quietly ashore or sliding off their boards, dived under the surf and were next seen far out at sea as a number of heads bobbing about like corks in smooth water, preparing for fresh exploits. The great art seems to be to mount the breaker precisely at the right time and to keep exactly on its curl just before it breaks. Two or three athletes who stood erect on their boards as they swept exultingly shores were received with ringing cheers by the crowd. Many of the less expert failed to throw themselves on the crest and slid back into smooth water or were caught in the breakers which were fully 10 feet high and after being rolled over and over, disappeared amidst roars of laughter and shouts from the shore. At first I held my breath in terror, thinking they were smothered or dashed to pieces, 
And then in a few seconds, I saw the dark heads of the objects of my anxiety bobbing about behind the breakers, waiting for another chance. The shore was thronged with spectators, and the presence of the elite of Hilo stimulated the swimmers to wonderful exploits. I enjoyed the afternoon thoroughly. Is it always afternoon here, I wonder? The sea was so blue, the sunlight so soft, the air so sweet. There was no toil, clang or hurry. People were all holiday making and enjoying themselves. The surf bathers in the sea and hundreds of gaily dressed men and women galloping on the beach. It was so serene and tropical. I envy those who remain forever on such enchanted shores. The glossary there, a breaker or a comber, terms used for when the large wave breaks into a white tide. Okay, so again, if I go through the same thought process, I think to myself, where was that section which was all about boards? Mm, I have a look through, Ooh, where was it down there? No, Ooh, I think it was up at the top. Yes, it was up at the top. The first paragraph is all about surfboards. Um, it then carries on. I read the second paragraph, I skim it. I'm literally just skimming and scanning. I can see here, uh, again, they're talking about boards. There we are. But I know that pretty much the first paragraph and the beginning of the second paragraph is going to help with the second question. If I scroll back to the th question three, So question three asked me to refer to source B, lines 18 to 25, uh, to consider the description of the surfers in the sea. So if I go back here, 18 to 25, oh look, the example are trying to help you and me and everyone. How they signify where line 18 is and where line 25 is. And so what we should do is get into the habit of Highlighting. Who knows if that will allow me to do it? It won't. But highlighting that particular section. So draw a box around it. Oh, there we go. It does work. How splendid. So we draw a little box around it. And um, with question three, that's what we know we're going to look at. Question four is asking us to consider the ways in which the writer's viewpoint, their perspective, what they think and what they feel is being presented to us. And again, I just want to be able to track approximately what's going on in each of those particular uh, pieces of writing. In this one, she's told about some surf, surfing, surf bathing, she calls it. Um, she then describes the act of the surfing because she's never seen it before. So there's quite a long description of what's going on. We have to remember she's writing a letter to other people who would not have seen it. So she's really quite descriptive. Uh, it's quite thorough, uh, an explanation of what surf bathing or surfing is. Um, as we moved on, line sort of 32 tells us that she thinks of, of horror. And all I'm doing here is I'm just reading the first line. I'm reading the first line so that it tells me approximately what the paragraph's going to be about. So she worries ultimately that they're going to um, be dashed to pieces, that they're going to die. Um, but then they come, they, they come from out of the water with their heads bobbing and say, like, oh, whew, relief. Uh, and how does it finish with a sort of discussion really of how amazing it is in Hawaii? She's envious of them. She's jealous of the life that they lead because it's so peaceful, it's so serene, it's so tropical, it's so happy. And I'm following the perspective all the way through. Now, it would be very easy for me to not read these two extracts. And uh, in any kind of timed conditions, you would not have somebody like me reading it. But the reason that teachers do read these things with a class is because you should hear how the cadences, how the rhythms, how intonation um, is, is demonstrated. So you, should, you, you should see it, you should hear it. Um, as I read, I'm moving my face a lot, I'm changing my voice, 
And when I'm doing those things, when I'm changing my voice, when I'm moving my face, it's often to indicate that these are words which are, which are interesting. I'm in a classroom, students kind of pick up on that stuff and they, they recognize that if a teacher says something loudly or in a strange way, that they should be paying real strict attention to it. When you're reading it for yourself, you have to read in this exaggerated style so that you can spot the phrases which stick out like a sore thumb. And that's why I'm holding my thumb up. That's what you're looking for. What are the bits which kind of tell you more than all the other words? That's it for this particular video. Um, the next one talks you through how to do the questions themselves. See you then.